Kevin, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, may I start by, by welcoming all of you to tonight's lecture and a particularly warm welcome, if I may, to those of you who are visiting the university today. You're very, very welcome and always will be welcome here with us. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues who are members of our university's Race, Equality and Diversity Forum for their energy and commitment to this very, very important cause. I'd like to thank our three distinguished speakers tonight, Rodney Hines, Diane Riney and Dumi Sender, uh, for giving up their time and sharing their thoughts and their ideas with us. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I'd also like to thank our chair, uh, Professor Kevin Hilton, for his commitment to this cause and for everything <coughs> you've put into this tonight, Kevin. Thank yeah. you. Let's not beat around the bush then. We face very, very significant equality challenges in higher education. In particular, very low proportions of female and very low proportions of black and minority ethnic staff in our universities and particularly in leadership roles. Let me offer you just some statistics that I've taken from the Equality Challenge Unit report on these matters. 68% uh, and, and I am an example of this of course, 68% of senior academic roles in our universities are occupied by white men. If I look at tonight's discussion about race equality then 16% of white male academics in the UK hold professorial roles. But if I look at the percentage of our black and minority ethnic female academic colleagues employed as professors, it's less than 3%. So there are really significant issues about equality and representation in higher education as a whole. But actually the challenges, I think, run much more deeply than mere <coughs> statistics. And our colleagues at the Equality Challenge Unit, again, have done surveys of colleagues across the sector. And what those surveys tell us is that many of our colleagues from black and ethnic minority backgrounds feel that their leadership abilities, when they're in leadership roles, are often questioned by others. They feel sometimes that they suffer disproportionate levels of scrutiny in carrying out their roles, just doing their jobs. And they also feel that they don't get the levels of mentoring and support that some other of their colleagues do. And this just isn't right, is it? If I look at student representation in higher education, then at first glance, and it is just at first glance, there is a better story to tell. Over the last five years, the representation of students from black and minority ethnic families has risen and it doesn't look out of proportion to the, to, to the general mix of the population as a whole. But the same can't be said of student attainment. So if we, if we measure student attainment, and it is only one measure, in terms of the good degrees that students get, the sort of thing that many employers look for when students are graduating from university, then 73% of white students get firsts and two ones, but just 57% of black and minority ethnic students do the same. I mean, that's a percentage gap of over 16%. Now, how can that be? When we start to look at those figures, that, that, that gap is still there, but it narrows to about 6% for younger students, so those around the ages between 18 and 21, but rises to a massive 36% for mature students. So how can that be? Now these are really, really significant issues. These are real equality challenges and challenges about fairness in our society and in our universities. Now, I have to say that every university in the land has to take steps to address these issues. I hope that acknowledging that these are issues is a first step I hope that talking about these issues is perhaps a second step. But the really big step is to make changes that improve this position. And I hope that the forum that we have tonight and the discussions that everybody here will be involved in will help us at our university here in Leeds to start making a difference and to start doing things that make a difference 
to our colleagues. So I say that now, and I unfortunately can't stay for the whole of today's session because I have to go to London on business. But I've, I've made the promise to Kevin that the discussion that <coughs> you, as our colleagues and our friends and supporters have tonight, I want to know about and I want to be involved in discussions about what we can do practically to change things here at our university and to start to make a difference. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for the contribution you're going to make to our discussions. And I look forward, obviously, to being engaged in this very big issue in my time here as our Vice-Chancellor. So thank you. OK, so uh, if you have a look at your programmes, you'll see that uh, Peter was initially down to respond to the whole discussion at the end of the session. So we'll just use that time to, to continue our discussion. Uh, I've asked um, Peter to respond to what he sees on the, f on the film, the photos and, and any reports that, uh, that come out of the, uh, the evening. Um, so, what did I uh, ask the, the speakers to, to do? I asked the speakers to, uh, to speak for about 15 minutes with uh, five minutes uh, with, t with, with time for, for discussion. Now, I said 15 minutes because I know that they'll take more. Uh, and you'll see from the programme that, that we do have more than 20 minutes per speaker. But I did ask them to, to speak for, for 15 minutes and then for us to, to leave time for, uh, for discussion. Um, and uh, in, the, in a, a panel uh, Q&A that, uh, that Tom Fletcher um, uh, kindly said that he would, he would chair. The reality of that is that he wasn't actually in attendance at the Race Equality and Diversity Forum when we decided that, <laughs> that we needed a panel chair. So, so that's, that's the, the situation. Um, our, our three speakers, you'll see uh, f uh, from your programme, are, uh, as Peter said, are uh, distinguished in each of their professions. Uh, Rod Rodney, uh, uh, the sports editor of The Voice uh, newspaper, with bags of, of experience, uh, in, uh, in the media. Um, uh, Diane, uh, business consultant, uh, track record in PR, um, uh, uh, fantastic reputation in management and di diversity marketing, and Dumi uh, uh, Sender, internationally acclaimed poet uh, and uh, children's author and, and peace uh, activist. We've asked, um, what, I, what I asked the speakers to do was to uh, to reflect upon the work that they do in each of each of their professions, and to, to give us a sense of, of their journey th through their professions, and to offer up ideas that we could take forward with uh, in in education um, that would help us in our uh, in in our work towards uh, uh, race uh, race equality. Because um, I think it's important that we that we don't become insular within education and think that we have the answers in here because we're a bunch of clever people. We can learn a lot from other people and that's why it's, it's fantastic that we've got uh, three uh, uh, internationally acc acclaimed speakers uh, here. Um, for those of you who were at the very first um, uh, biennial, the inaugural biennial uh, lecture, uh, you, you might remember that I put up the original forum objectives. So these were the, the forum objectives that we, that we decided to work towards because we felt that even though the sector, the higher, higher education institutions, were doing poorly where it, where it uh, comes to race equality and diversity, we wanted to set our own standards and move forwards from, uh, from there. So we wanted to make sure that, that anyone who joined the forum would have recognition in their, in their deployment, in their work allocation. Uh, we wanted to uh, ensure that the governance uh, uh, structure recognised the, the forum's work and it fed into 
um, their, their activities. The issues, that there are clearly uh, highs and lows to the work that we're, we're doing because uh, uh, in, 20, in 2010, when this forum um, uh, was, est was established, we were talking about these issues here around recruitment and selection of staff and student diversity and <coughs> staff and student attrition and attainment. And we heard just a few moments ago from the Vice-Chancellor Peter Slee that we still have these same issues. Okay, so, so for me, these are the, are the lows of the activities for the Race, Equality and Diversity Forum that we're still having to deal with these issues uh, uh, five, years, uh, five years on. Um, and, and these are issues f uh, f right across the sector. Um, so, so these are lows. And we've got a long way to go in terms of uh, what Peter was saying around, around glass, ceilings, uh, uh, glass ceilings as well. But for the highs for me over the last, the last five years have been the fantastic attendance and engage, en engagement of staff in the university who are academics and involved in, in, uh, in service work um, for the Race Equality uh, and Diversity Forum. Uh, I've... Uh, I've been particularly impressed by the input into the race charter mark activity that we've been recently uh, engaged in. Uh, and I'm also um, very pleased that we've moved past that whole notion of, of focusing on a Black History Month. And through the Race Equality and Diversity Forum, the university have, has accepted the idea of of, a, of a, an annual calendar of events, which we've entitled, until we find a better title, uh, uh, the World Culture and Heritage uh, Calendar. So that's a year-round uh, programme of, of activities. Um, and of course, this, this annual lecture, as, as it is, is part of, of all of that. Uh, in the, we've had one forum meeting this, this year thus far, the next one is on the 19th of January, um, where we'll be looking again at, at these objectives. And um, we would encourage staff who are not, in, uh, staff from uh, Leeds Beckett uh, University, who are not involved with the forum, to get involved. And perhaps, uh, and perhaps you can, with us, work through establishing new objectives for, for the forum, because we can't sit back on our laurels. So, would you like to get involved with developing the World Culture and Heritage uh, calendar? Would you like to get involved in, work in working on the race charter mark? Or are there other ideas um, that you would like to incorporate into our uh, forum objectives? So there's no point in sniping from the sidelines. You've, you need to get involved. So I would encourage anybody who wants to get involved to come, uh, to come and see me uh, uh, after this <laughs> Uh, 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 this uh, annual lecture, or um, or any other member of the of the forum, they'll make them. Just put your hands up if you're a member of the Race Equality and Diversity Forum. Okay, so they're amongst you. Um, so it, it falls on me to uh, to introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Dumi Sander. Um, <laughs> I don't really need to say a great deal more than you've got in your programme. I've already said something about, about Doomy's uh, accomplishments. But we've asked uh, Doomy uh, to intersperse his activities throughout the evening, and you, you'll see that as the evening goes along. Uh, so could you uh, join me in welcoming uh, Doomy Sender uh, to, the, to the podium? Okay, I'm try all right, I'm trying to minimize it so I can, ah, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Professor Kevin, for inviting me to be part of this and the entire uh, equalities, um, you know, race equality team. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm just going to, you know, in keeping with our, if you like, mandate really for the evening, um, you know, share a bit about if you like my my thoughts, my journey, perhaps um, as, as someone who's attempted to use, if you like, the creative arts 
um, you know, to, you know, I don't want to say fight racism, but, you know, because there's no other <coughs> better term perhaps to fight racism. Um, but in many ways, lately I've been reflecting, um, you know, on, if you like, the impact of my work. So I'm going to share a little bit about that and then read a poem. So I'm kind of splitting it in two. Um, so in, in a sense, my aim for tonight is to try and provoke thought uh, through my poetry, in a sense. Uh, but, but I will give a few uh, insights into my own thinking, in a sense. So I'm going to play this short video here. It's a two-minute video just to you know, get us started before um, I, s I speak to you. Hopefully it will play. Okay. Okay, do we have volume? <coughs> okay, I'm There's not sure. No message for black yeah, people or a message for white people. What I've learned from years working with community is this. Now, there's a message for people. The message touches everyone the same way, and people as individuals will take that message and apply it to their own unique circumstances. They do not apply the message to their skin like most men. The message to influence our thoughts, to often touch our souls and our hearts. From the point of view of a speaker, your job is done. Your job is not to prescribe solutions for people, but it's to get people thinking, to give them those questions that they can take away and begin to formulate their own solutions to their own situation. You think that the message will be, they can find something from that message that will mean something to them. Okay, so in a sense, that kind of sums up my thoughts in a, in a sense. Um, but I'll try, I mean, some of you may have come across the blog that I think was circulated um, in the week. Um, you know, like I said, um, I've, I've you know, been lucky really to have years of working with communities. I'm from Zimbabwe myself. Um, but I've, you know, I've got experience working with African communities. I've got uh, been living here in England for you know quite a while now, working with local communities as well as NGOs, some international, some local. So, uh, but in all that work, particularly working with young people, which is something I'm very passionate about, um, a lot of my work has been about you know this idea of, if I may probably find a, you know, academic word, you know, non-racialism in a sense. Um, so, which is the idea that you know we. Um, when we look at ourselves, you know, whether you're, you're white or black, almost, you know, arguing that color is invisible in a sense. Um, and I would, I would like to probably identify this notion, you know, and associate it with, if you like, you know, the concept of one love by Bob Marley on one end. Or to an extent, perhaps you could argue uh, Nelson Mandela's idea of, you know, um, you know, moving on reconciliation, this forward-looking reconciliation. So those kind of ideas have inspired me for a long time in my, in my life and through my poetry as well. Um, certainly I've been inspired by people like Martin Luther King, you know, in the way that they obviously fought injustice, um, you know, using this idea that, you know, we, we are all human beings in the end and we can all come together, um, you know, and fight injustice. And that's, that's how society should be. But as I've kind of begun to reflect lately, and, and indeed as we should, um, I've begun to question myself, you know, whether in, in kind of... Um, pushing this non-racialism idea, whether I have been also co-opted into into a narrative which which kind of actually avoids the problem in a sense, you know. Because if you begin to think about it, what is a non-racial world? Uh, what is a race-neutral world? A race-neutral world is probably um, you know more a, a, a status quo, if you like, you know, or a, a, a world which for for those who are already up in the hierarchy, if you like. You know? <coughs> so I began to think that you know. Um, in a sense, without being aware myself, I've been kind of excusing, um, you know, racism in a sense. And I've begun to grapple with this notion of racial inclusivism um, as opposed to racial, uh, to non-racialism, um, which is the idea that, look, it doesn't matter that, you know, me being black or you or someone else being white or brown or whatever color they are, uh, is not per se the issue. But the issue is, um, our identities are then kind of, you know, divided and hierarchies are constructed, you know. So this construction of hierarchies is what in the end causes um, issues. That's, that's what racism is all about. It's hierarchization of racial identity, you know. So for me, this is an ongoing battle. Uh, so, I, I, you know, in a sense, I, I look forward to seeing how my poetry will evolve in the next few, <laughs> few years. Uh, but for now, uh, this is where I am. And, and I'm going to share a poem with you, which I wrote. Um, you know, it's called a tick in the box. 
in a sense, this poem I wrote it to try and um, and challenge us really, challenge the idea of what does equality mean? You know, does equality mean when you look around the room, you know, and there are people of all colors, then therefore we say it's, a, it's an equal society? You know, does equality mean when you have a team and you've got maybe one black person in the team, and then you say, well, we've ticked the box, is that equality? You know, um, does it mean when you have one woman in the team, you know, then you say, well, we've got gender equality. What, what does equality mean? So I'm going to read this poem and just invite you really to reflect about that. I'm sure, um, you know, our speakers are going to, you know, go much into that. Like I said, I would try and kind of provoke thought through my poetry in a sense. Okay, so tick in the box. Oh, I will help, I'll happily line up with them. Ones for whom lining up is a right by birth. They do not have to try half as much. But happily, I shall strive twice as much, then twice more for half as much shine and glow. In the same ponds, I shall swim with the great wise. And be happy to be, if not for a moment, a pea in the pod. Smile and not, and, and not once complain. For this much do I know, I am but a pigeon amongst the cats, a tick in the box. Like that angel rhyme still arise, just like dust and so beyond the ceilings of glass, holding down my kind. Oh yes, I'll defy the skies and reach moons deep and blind suns with the burning of my passion. The clouds above will know. They will know. This compassion combusting the chambers of my heart. They of little faith. They of little shame. Preach against hypocrisy. Then serve the same at dinner sittings, expecting me to eat up. At the races, I shall join them. But they are Tables do not lower me a bit. The water they wash their hands with, they expect me to drink and to dry my hands with towels that wipe their feet. Or oh, I would rather dine on desert thorns than on leftovers glot. But to reach the shores, alas, I shall be the good sailor I ought to be. For what value is there in rocking the boat? When my waist is lined rich with metal shackles. And my head laden, laden with rocks that drowned my whole kind. I would rather be part of something I can never quite belong to than belong to something I could never be quite a part of. Thank you. Um, we have a, a few minutes for questions, if anybody uh, has any questions for, for Dumi. And they've got, so we've, we've got one. Any, yeah. any more? Can we just get a sense of... So we'll, we'll take these, these two questions, uh, one, then, then two. <laughs> So you've have you seen this reflected or <coughs> you know, what particular issues have you had to juggle with? Or okay. Um, so, sorry, if, if you don't mind me kind of trying to understand the question. So, um, so what kind of issues have I encountered in, in my work um, being 
you know, of my identity? Is that the question? Yeah, do you mean yep. poetry and the kind of creative work that you do? Okay, yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of it, I mean, you know, I've had my experiences of, uh, of racism, but I, do, I don't think any more than the next person, you know. When, when, when people are, you know, those people who are, when people are being racist, I mean, I've, I've experienced racism in terms of uh, direct racism, if you like, but I've, I've also experienced what I think is much, much more worrying, which is institutional racism, which in a sense, sometimes it's difficult to actually pinpoint and therefore difficult to, to if you like, uh, address or even, you know, find redress with, in that circumstance. But for me, I've always found that poetry has been, you know, or, or the creative arts, I also use stories, have always been, if you like, a, uh, my way of dealing with it. So therefore, um, you know, I could have been very angry, you know, uh, and, pr and pro probably, you know, hated one group of people or another group of people. But in a sense, my response, um, you know, has been, you know what, I, I, I want to try and understand these issues. And then I realized that as a world citizen myself, you know, I have a role in actually changing things in a positive way. Um, so in a sense, that's, that's what I've tried to do. So for me, in a sense, injustice inspires me, you know, to, to be even more creative. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't discourage me. It doesn't hold me back. In fact, it inspires me to, to do more. Any response to that? No, there's also something that you were saying earlier about the non race orientation. Yeah. And, um, they yeah, apologize. They're a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, a bit of a mouthful. I'm still grappling with it myself. Uh, okay, I mean, you know, so really put simply, what, what I was trying to say is my understanding of, of this issue called racism, in, you know, before was this idea of focusing. In a sense, I was also, you know, you can fight racism uh, through, um, you know, you could fight racism by saying, well, you know, black doesn't exist, white doesn't exist, you know, let's pretend we're all one people. But I've, I've, I've begun to think this is a problem. Actually, you know, some, if someone is blonde hair, I cannot deny that they've blonde hair. Uh, the fact that I've got black hair, I cannot deny that, you know. But the issue is not necessarily that you've got blonde hair and I've got black hair, uh, hair if someone does. But it's actually that, um, you know, we then construct these identities and give them value. So that value differential between, you know, black hair and blonde hair, if you like, or, you know, white and black, you know, that's, that's the issue, you know. So in a sense, I'm, I'm kind of moving away from this idea of non-racialism, you know, and beginning to kind of find, um, you know, my way, I'm still thinking it through, my way through racial inclusivism, if you like. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we've got uh, another... There will be time, remember, at the end when we have the, the, the panel discussion. So perhaps I think we'll have time for one more question for, for Dewey, and then perhaps we can take Emily's question first in the panel. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for me. Uh, Mr. Dewey, I know you have talked about uh, your experience. I'd like to find out with the way the, the uh, recruitment structure and um, Admission structure in this institution has been structured. Mm. Is it structured to address the race equality or <coughs> equality in at workplace or wherever? When they will say, okay, the white British, black British, mm. uh, black African, uh, Caribbean, and they start listing it down, down, down. Mm. Is, it, is it put there? to cost uh, equality or just to highlight the uh, race quality we were talking about? Yeah, um, thank you, sir. If, if you'd asked me that question, uh, say, six months ago, my answer would have been very, uh, I would have been confident that, you know what, the issue is <laughs> let's remove those boxes. You know, that, that, that would have been my answer back then. Um, but now, like I said, you know, uh, because, you know, those boxes says, are you white, are you black, are you, you know, I've always had a problem with that, you know, in a sense, um, you know, are you African? Well, you know, where do you draw the line? So I always had a problem with that. But in a sense, now I'm wondering whether we need to make those boxes bigger. You know, uh, like I said, I don't have the answer. It's something that I'm uh, trying to think through myself. But uh, I get what you're saying, and I think it is a structural problem. You know, and, and we have to realize that it is a structural problem. You know, in um, I came to study international relations and peace studies here. One thing I I, I quickly realized is actually. The information itself, you know, in terms of the people that we have to reference, you know, um, the, you know, in, in, the, the ideas from which we draw are all people who are, you know, it's all Euro Eurocentric, right? These are, are, are people either, from, you know, from the Western world who are also white, you know. Um, 
and in, in realizing that, I've, I've, I've also realized that, you know what, there's also another structural issue from, um, if you like, communities from Africa or Caribbeans, and the, which is that sometimes also we have to realize that um, how to deal with this is also contributing to research. You know, so while yes, there may be problems in uh, in in how we, you know systems recruit and everything, I think there's also need for us to take seriously some opportunities to actually showcase our knowledge, you know, to value our knowledge. So therefore, if someone says there's a a, a Caribbean poet or African poet uh, speaking in Leeds, would we actually value that and go and listen, or or uh, unless so, you know this someone has uh, been to the UN perhaps or somewhere, then we begin to see that okay, so therefore they are worth listening to. So in, in, in a sense, I think it's, it's an issue of attitude on one hand, but it's also a very structural issue that we have to realize that, you know, by contributing knowledge so that we, you know, there, there can be a diversity of knowledge, maybe we can begin to make changes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tim. Um, so we'll be able to talk to Dumi uh, in, a, in a little while uh, in the panel. Um, I'd like to invite Dan Riney to uh, to address the uh, the audience. Um, if you have a look in your your programmes, I, I, I won't uh, want to be want to condescend in any way because I know you've got the programme in front of you. You, you can see that uh, that. So I'm trying to do two things at once here. Uh, uh, you can you can see that uh, Diane has a, a fantastic uh, reputation in PR, in marketing and diversity management and uh, is, a, is a great person to, to come and, and talk to us about, about her work and perhaps the lessons we can learn um, from her journey uh, in business. So, uh, Dr. Diane Riney, uh, could you uh, join us? Good evening. Good evening. Well, I had a really well prepared talk for you, and some of it I will throw in the bin, um, and some of it I will stay to script. Um, I've been in business for over 22 years, and in 2009, I was privileged, I think may be the word, I'm not quite sure yet, to win an award for the most outstanding black woman business owner in the whole of the United Kingdom. And yes, it's an achievement, but I was the only person of colour. Nobody else was my competition who looked like me. Yesterday, I attended an award in London called the Black British Business Awards. And there was whew, over 500 people there and I, the room was full of amazing, and I mean from people working in science to black business owners, you know, making 800 million turnover a year. It was amazing. But when I looked at some of the people who we received the awards from, they didn't look like us. So it was very interesting in some one sense, there are some of us doing some really, really magnificent stuff. But then when I came out of the room and was on my tweeting to see what was um, trending, it was the younger generation who I unfortunately didn't get to see the inspirational role models that was in that room. Tickets were 300 pounds for a lunch. And there lies the problem. It was very corporate. So we had your Barclays and your normal suspects promoting it. So since 2009 and to date, I don't know what has changed. And that's the sad reality. When I started, I started in marketing and public relations. And I used to do, well, well when I left, I thought, well, everybody does marketing and public relations. I want to be, want to be different. And I've had a real issue about equality, so I thought, I'm going to do diversity marketing. And that's where the problem started. Before I could even sell my product or what I did, <coughs> I had to explain to the diversity managers of those corporations what diversity really meant. And this is why I have an issue in regards to higher education. Um, 
I do a number of things. So as I said, my company is 22 years old and I have offices around the world. I have spoken from the White House to many different organisations and spoke about issues such as these. Um, and the same issues keep coming up. So we say we can talk about lots of stuff, but what are the solutions to some of these issues we have? Um, so let me start about my journey. Um, I come from a really hmm, bad estate in a place called Luton. And when I grew up, I just heard lots of fighting and lots of stuff going on. Um, and my mum had, I was blessed with two amazing parents who, I had a black library in my house. So when I went to, finally went on to school, I was very clear about who I was. You couldn't tell me anything. I was beautiful, I could achieve, I could do anything. Because that's what I was told. So one day when I was at school and I, I've always had a love of books, and that is from my mother. I love to read. So I wanted to do something that meant learning English and doing well in English. I was told by my wonderful English teacher then, um, what do you want to learn English for? Black people don't need to learn English, which at the time I thought, didn't quite understand what he was talking about. But... The point remains for me, I use that as a positive. I use that to drive me to prove her wrong and to do very well in English, which I went on to do extremely well, to the point I used my English in journalism because I ended up going on not long after I left school to interview Martin Luther King Jr.'s wife, the late Coretta Scott King. I remember her saying, I said, how did you, how did you have the strength to do what you did every day, get spat at, have your house firebombed and all these stuff and know that your husband one day probably wouldn't come home with all your children. And you know what she said? I remember just sitting there in a bit of awe. She said, um, because I'm talking to a young, successful black woman like you. And that's what made it worth it. She said she always knew her husband was going to die at some point. It's just something they just knew. But it's all about getting that conversation started and having the real conversations. So I would suggest the few things that have always come to me. I've had my education both in the UK and in the US. Um, and as a psychologist, a businessman and a mentor, I would like to share a few thoughts with you of what I think and what some of my um, some of the people I work with um, and the young people I work with who are presently doing in higher education at the moment think. So my food for thought is the student experience, whilst I studied in the US, I felt the campuses were truly multi-ethnic. It wasn't merely that there were students and staff of different race and religions. It was as though the campus environment was tailored for inclusion for all. Yes, there were groups and clubs, but it was more than that. From the diverse restaurant menus, facilities, pastoral care and events, it was a cosmopolitan environment. My concern is that British university campuses often <coughs> feel as though they are ticking boxes. By having student union groups, but the environment is still essentially designed for the white middle class demographics. I believe a progressive academic environment should be a, an absolute reflection of young modern Britain today, diverse, accepting, bicultural and inclusive. My concern is our campuses become cliquey and in the process end up segregated. It's perhaps the required quota approach to achieving equality that leads to failure by some un universities when it comes to equality. I also believe we have much work to do in ensuring that our university generation who increasingly no longer fit the white middle class mould of the 1970s, feel understood and heard and welcomed. Here is where you will have the audience interaction game. And then what, what goes on to say is, can you tell me what percentage of university professors do you think are black? 
Does anybody have any idea? Seven. Seven? University professors. One. Zero point five percent of university professors are black in comparison to ninety two point four who are white. In my opinion, this approach should also extend to the diversity of university teachers. Earlier this year, the Rummy Mood Trust produced a report which found that 92%, 92.4% of professors were white, while, while black professors numbered less than half of a percent. There are less than 20 black female professors in British academia. 20. This is an important area in which UK <coughs> universities desperately need to address their gender and racial balance. I believe our young people learn largely by example. If they are to feel that their postgraduate options are vast, the best example they can be presented with is a teaching staff that mirror the opportunities we currently tell them are at hand. When I was living in the US, I was always often asked to come and be a guest lecturer at universities. One, because I'm working in the profession, if they're studying media or journalism. And two, I'm black and I'm a female. And what it did, it encouraged the students to think, mm, it is possible that maybe there's somebody who's actually working in the, professor, in the profession and they can see somebody who they can identify and it's proven in America to be a great success. Now, I'm not saying America is the perfect model. It's just what I can compare to when I was studying in the UK versus the US. A quick example of this is many young black people are opting to study business at higher education. However, the Mayor of London report demonstrated that black-owned businesses are severely underrepresented. Black-owned businesses comprise 4% of all businesses in the UK. This is where I believe a hands-on approach to education is required. Students need to be monitor, men, uh, mentored and provision set in place so that they are not simply left to do it once they pass their degrees. Similarly, in my industry of media, black and ethnic workers are, are so sorely underrepresented in the advertising and media industry. What would you say for the media industry? There's only 10% <coughs> that look like me. I mean, I was having a conversation with my colleague who's going to come up next, Rodney, and I was, um, I was asked by an American colleague, oh, I'm, doing, I'm doing some research, I need to know, um, can you name me the black, um, a black person who has an anchor program on TV? <coughs> none. Yeah, no, I said, right now, none. And when we say anchor, I mean like, you know, your top prime time shows, none. There are news readers, but there are none who have anchorship shows. I was told once when I went to audition to do um, a programme at the time that I was really good, but I wasn't blonde. I said I could dye my hair. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, quite, didn't quite work. So you can see it's all about the images and what people that we find and what we see. I mean, I have twin girls. They're seven years old. And one of them came home, and I'm, I'm big into education. I really believe education is a key for the poverty gap. That's for me. That's what done it for me. Um, but already the signs are there in their education. When one of them came home and said, I want to be peach. Peach? What's that? They said, they said peach. They said, the peach ones always get the main parts. The peach ones always get to do certain things. The peach ones do the private education. The peach ones do all these kinds of things. I gathered quickly what peach meant. Um, it's a problem. And I really think, I don't know how I feel about, you know, I do think in one sense having your African Caribbean communities and, and your like um, clubs and stuff are a great thing. But it's, you're preaching to the converted. Am I that boring? I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, you're preaching to the converted. A bit like what? 
a bit like what I said when I went out yesterday, and even though it was an amazing event, most of the people in there looked like me. <laughs> and the main people who needed to be there were the CEOs of the big corporate companies. There are serious issues. And I just think where it comes to education, higher education, I think we just need to look at having more people. And it's going to take a while to get them through the system. But I think if you had guest speakers, guest lecturers, just people from different female, disability, all sorts. One of my twins is disabled. So I teach her that we're all special in different ways. It's about having different representations so that then they can look to say, it's possible, because I believe everything is about hope and showing people that these things are possible. And I think it starts with us. Thank you for listening. Oh. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, a running trust mm -hmm. report, mm -hmm. aiming higher. Mm -hmm. Jason, are you here? Jason Arde? Jason, can you just put your hand up, Jason? So Jason's a, a member of the Race Equality and Diversity Forum, and he was one of the co-editors oh, of, it was a of good that report. Renamid. It was a it was a great Fantastic. report. Fantastic. So well done, Jason. <laughs> uh, and uh, a few of you might know this, but Jason's just defended his his uh, PhD thesis. So congratulations on, on that as well. Um, so we've got a bit of time for a, a few questions um, for. Diane, are there any questions for, for Diane? So we have oh, one, pick. two, three, okay, let's, and four, okay, I've got to include Claude there. <laughs> All right, so, so we've got, have you got your order? So we've got one and then there was two, three and four with, with Claude. Okay. I suppose I'm interested in knowing if you found, um, are you aware of any programs that the universities are implementing to recruit BMA staff? Um, the, the problem is a bit like, um, um, what's your, um, your, is it your ch Chancellor, what's his name? Peter, Sorry, Peter, Peter Slee. Said. Yes. It's, it's the rate that the black students are dropping out is a worry. We're not even, they're not even getting to that place where they're qualified to go on and be lecturers and do the things to make these changes that I would like to see. Um, but I think that's all about um, things what I believe are making it in an environment that's more inclusive. Um, it's seeing people that look like you. It's having, like I said, guest lecturers from the different um, industries <coughs> talk to you. And, you know, in my company, obviously I can kind of do what I want um, and I have a real diverse work staff you know I mean I've put things in like everybody in my in my business has to give one day a month to your charitable course or you don't come and work for me I believe in giving back um, I do mentoring programs and I think those are really important I was at, um, saying that I just was in Nottingham on Monday and gave a talk to um, in the prison and there's some incarcerated, highly educated, <laughs> you know, highly qualified people, but they've just felt like they did not fit in, did not fit in, did not fit in. So I do think it's one in those kinds of programmes, but not just doing it like, you know, like Black History Month, as I say to everybody, I'm not just black on the October, I'm, you know, I'm black every month, <coughs> every day of the year. So these things need to be, you know, filtered in throughout they're not just these tick things that you put in just for an occasion. It has to be throughout and run through the real fabric of a university. So, so the question, the, the question wasn't really answered there. Uh, you know, in in that, you know, in terms of <laughs> in, in that in in that in that Diane couldn't name a you know specific no I, no, I said a specific I could, I can't. project, but there was a, a really good yeah. response yeah. response there. I mean, I maybe there are others in the audience who might be able to offer up some examples of where there's been a, a positive, perhaps a positive action focus on re the, the recruitment of black and uh, minor minoritised ethnic staff. Can I make a... Oh, so are you answering the question? Yes, it looks like there is an answer for yeah, it. Yeah, well, um, this afternoon I had a session for the Access and Widely Participation Team. It was an event with careers advisors and teachers which targets particularly um, 
schools where there's a high proportion of disadvantaged, underrepresented young people, and especially in Leeds, where some of our communities have high, you know, like an Asian community living there, sometimes I find it completely shocking that our classrooms are predominantly white. It does not reflect our community. And I, I'm really glad this afternoon I got the chance to speak to those teachers and careers advisors so that, you know, we could support them in their roles in the schools and in the community. And I know Inda's there, so, you know, she does a lot of that as well and is significant to what we do in terms of that for the university. But it was good to be able to do that to begin to perhaps not only change our curriculums to make them reflective of those different groups, but also by making those curriculums appealing and reflecting the work that Jason does, hopefully attract some of those students from our own doorstep. Perhaps you can ask another question at, uh, when we get to the panel mm. session. We've, we've got another... Um, yes. yeah, uh, basically, uh, I'm currently working at the university as IT technician, and um, I'm doing my placement, yeah. Uh, my question is regards uh, to my own situation. Basically, uh, when I was uh, trying to go for my placement year last year, uh, it's taken me over 100 interviews. Not 100 interviews, sorry. I applied for over, I did over 100 applications and I've had to do at least over 20 interviews, mm -hmm. whereas some of my class had one interview and they got on the job already like that. Where do you think the university should address problems being issued to this space? when uh, they try to go for graduate jobs? <coughs> um, again, it is about, I know, I, I mean, I in universities, I don't know as many programmes. I know lots of things in schools. You know, there's quite a lot of work going on in the grassroots, which is really great. Um, and again, it's about having that, that pr it's about them, you know, um, connecting with businesses, having a real good dialogue, you know, not just around when it's recruitment, I mean, generally a good dialogue so that they come in and out all the way through the year. And then that may help in regards to recruiting from, you know, um, you know, blacks, um, women, all sorts of stuff. I think it has to start, they just have to set up those kinds of programs. And it's gonna take work, but it can be done because, I mean, I hear these stories all the time, um, but it has to start from there. Can I just ask you, have you noticed the pattern in your area? A, a pattern of, have, you, have you noticed the pattern of this sort of uh, activity around uh, recruitment and selection of, of uh, um, black and minority ethnic the thing is, students? Is normally I'm, when, like, I'm a BAE student, I've got a disability as well, so I don't know if that's going to counter against me when I do both interviews. It make yeah. it harder. Like, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, mm. I mean, it's, it's just some sometimes it's difficult to speak of a mm. specific case, but where a, there is a pattern that that has has developed, I mean, it's, it's seriously something that, that that needs to be considered. But still, you know, the, the point that's been raised is a is a good point that needs to be taken on board mm. by the university. Mm. Um, I think we is, is okay. I think we've got time for for one more. Claude, can I? Can I ask you, can you, can you go second after Emily in the panel? Okay, for sure. Okay, um, but we could just take one more over here. Sorry, yes. Hi, um, Hi. my name's John Hamilton. I work with the Equality and Diversity Team at the University. Uh, your, your, um, it's a very fascinating day, thank you very much. And I think together with our Vice Chancellor's opening, the two sit really well together. Um, I, I, I'm massively encouraged by the momentum that at our race equality agenda has at our university, the fantastic attendance here today, the work that Kevin and the Race Equality Forum do. Um, and, and, and probably most importantly for me, our new Vice Chancellor, his words at the beginning around determination for change and personally sponsoring that change uh, give me and, and, and the team at Leeds University, at Leeds Beckett University, there's not many of us, so you know, to have that empowerment from the top. So my question for you with that context mm -hmm. is, if, 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 you, if I could lock you in a room with him for half an hour, <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what would your message to, be, to him be about where he needs to start to make a difference to closing some of those recruitment progression and attainment gaps that we've, we've, you know, that we've illustrated today? I think it's about, I think most people are not really honest. I'll be really, I'll be upfront. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, I'm not backward in coming forward. I mean, I don't care who you are. If I feel that something's unjust, I will let you know. So I would think he should set up those meetings and, you know, start with the star. We'll have a <coughs> real open and honest conversation. And that's what, and that some of that ownership is going to be on you guys. 
being honest, not like, okay, he's the boss or whatever, I'm going to say what <coughs> I should say. It's about being honest. And then from that data, whatever he cl collates, it's also about having a real honest dialogue with the students, you know. And, and I mean, again, it's about having an honest dialogue. And, and it's all about once you get that data, you then have to see where the gaps are and what you can do. And I also think I'm a very big thing about the businesses and your local communities and stuff and having them involved in all the small organisations, which I think do amazing <coughs> work, to help in the whole process. Because to me, I think it takes a <coughs> village to raise a family. I'm kind of old school like that. And a university is such a hub. It really is a hub. And so if you get all the community involved, I think you can see a real, cha real change. But it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Thank you. Thank you. Diane.